Coming up on Virginia Currents, the Nat Turner Slave Rebellion. We meet a descendant of Nat Turner and a descendant of Turner slave owners. Find out how they stand together in the mission of equality and freedom. Also, how Turner's tattered Bible impacts millions of people at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. We go to D.C. to find out how this young museum is a true testament of America's history and making modern history in the Virginia General Assembly. Delegate LaCherise Aird shares how she's shaping the Commonwealth's future as the youngest woman ever elected to the House, plus the soul-stirring music of Nate Emanuel, all next on Virginia Currents. Welcome to Virginia Currents, I'm Amy Lacey. On August 21st, 1831, Nat Turner led the deadliest slave rebellion ever in U.S. history. Because the Person family was linked to the most victims in the two-day rebellion, they were given Nat Turner's Bible, which had been held by the Southampton County Courthouse for several decades after Nat Turner's hanging. In an area where the Turner Rebellion is a hush topic, we meet two people whose ancestors come from opposite sides. Evelyn Hawkins, whose family are descendants of Nat Turner and owns the property where Nat Turner was captured, and Mark Person, who's a descendant of Nat Turner's slave owners and the revolt's initial victims. Let's now find out about the rebellion as told through Mark and Evelyn's eyes and the unpredictable and healing journey of Nat Turner's most coveted possession, his Bible. Now these are your people, Mark. Yes, and ties into the okay. Nat Turner story. That person goes a long ways, you even it, have a church it, named after it. It does, so we... Uh, I would talk city. about it to some people, but you have to be careful about who you talk about Nat Turner too. This tragedy was integrated. There are both people on both sides whose, both, whose families were affected, and you don't know how they feel about it still. We had ancestors that were killed, and you know, I, I think about it daily, I'm subconscious maybe, but I think it's uh, very significant what happened. I, I think it applies to society today. You have to, people, you have to respect people's opinions. Not everybody's going to agree with you. I first learned about Nat Turner from my grandfather, Sidney Turner, uh, whose wife, Corrine Turner, was supposed to be linked to Nat Turner through her family. But he taught us that Nat Turner was a great man, that uh, we were not to talk about this outside of our home, because my grandfather was a very prominent farmer in uh, Southampton County and uh, people did business with him with a handshake. Uh, Nat Turner is getting a well-known reputation as a powerful minister in the county. He's white people, black people, he's well-liked. A white man by the name of Ethel Brantley approaches him and says, I'd like you to baptize me, and which is in the times very significant. You have a white person af asking an African-American who's enslaved to baptize him. Some, one of the local churches says no, but he approaches my ancestor, John Person, who owns the mill pond, and he said, no questions asked. He said, everyone's welcome. 1828, uh, Nat Turner baptizes himself and Mr. Brantley. The other slaves were kind of in awe of him because he could read and he could write. He was very literate, and not all the slave owners could read and write. And uh, he'd been reading the Bible over the years. And he just thought he heard the Word of God to tell him to do that too. He was looking for a sign. And the sign came. Eclipse. Okay, that's Water. right, eclipse. A great eclipse. Okay, we got you here, know, Cabin Pond right over here. Right, and that's where Ned Turner met with some of his lieutenants there, right. only about six of them, the day of the rebellion. Where it all started, right here. Yeah, is where it began, mm -hmm. the planning. His most trusted confidants, when they met, he, uh, I think they knew it could be a potential suicide mission, but he was standing yeah. up for a yeah, cause. They and stood up. He, he thought that maybe from farm to farm he would pick up, and he did. Up to 70 went with him. And, and, uh, and no one broke rank. There were other 
rebellions prior to that. There was Gabriel's in yeah. Richmond, Virginia back to 1800 and they didn't make it. Then mm -hmm. Denmark, BC, 1822, Charleston, South Carolina. I think the reason Ned Turner said an eye for an eye and uh, he thought he was delivering justice for slaves. Evidently, he had seen the harshness of slavery. I mean, who wants to be enslaved? You know, slavery had been going on then, I guess about 200 years. Nat Turner in his lifetime, he had four owners. When he's moving to the third owner, his wife sold to another family, mm -hmm. basically. Right. And Thomas Moore, he marries Sally Francis. He's my great, great aunt. Thomas Moore passes away, and Sally, she remarries Joseph Travis. When the insurrection takes place, they're first family that are victims of the insurrection. And the next house that's involved is uh, they go to the brother, Salathiel Francis. This is my great, great uncle. When they left Salathiel's home, they, they go through some other uh, properties and they're heading to Lavinia's house. My great-great-grandmother, she's uh, eight months pregnant with her first child and one of the enslaved of Salathiel, his name is Red Nelson, lived in the house with Salathiel. He actually gets out of the house and makes it to Lavinia's house and there's a, a little cubby hole, if you will, up in the attic. They actually hide her in the cubby hole and put blankets on her. It's an old spinning wheel up there and, and they, there's another enslaved who's looking out for her. They said, hurry, she's run out the back. You need to catch her. And, and they saved her life. Charlotte Harris Musgrave was on her way to see her, had heard about the rebellion and uh, she was afraid. Her, her husband was not there at home and she was left at home. She wanted to go to her father, which was Captain Newitt Harris. So she got her baby George, who's buried out here in this stove in this yard, and uh, another uh, female slave to go with her. And uh, they start, they travel. They were traveling. Meanwhile, she was coming from her house. Nat Turner was coming from the opposite direction on the way to her father's home to kill those people. However, the slaves stopped Charlotte first and say, we have your father here in the woods. So when Nat Turner got to the house, no one was there. George was the father of my great grandmother. She was a slave. George fathered five children by Elizabeth. They had gotten to that house, Newitt Harris's house, about the, before Nat Turner got there. There would have been no us. You know, he wouldn't be here right, either be. <laughs> if, if uh, someone had not hit yeah. his aunt. So it's it's a lot. It's a story to think about, really. Rebecca Vaughn was the last family involved in the insurrection that were slain. Uh, Rebecca Vaughn, Analyza Vaughn, and her Rebecca Vaughn's son Arthur were the last three victims involved in the insurrection. The house is currently under restoration. It was donated to the Southampton County Historical Society and moved to this location, so it's under preservation and the uh, there's a sword of Nat Turner in this, last I had spoken to the uh, Historical Society, the future home of the sword is going to be in the Rebecca Vaughn house. How many of the victims were there? Slave owners and the families, the white families, mm -hmm. uh, approximately 55 to 60. Yeah, that's what I heard. And then the, and the reprisal afterwards, it, mm -hmm. it was yeah, real just, bad. Wow. It was like, yeah, they just kill them all, kill yeah, like, everybody who was associated with Nat Turner, either was not associated, they could kill about 200. My grandfather worked hard 
on this land, to, to get this land, to keep it for us. And he made sure that we knew every inch of it. He purchased it from Joseph Simmons Musgrave. This is where he and, was uh, captured at. He was, this is where he was captured. This indentation here, which my grandfather put this up here, I guess over 100 years ago. So we would always know where it was. It was like a, like a big tree, like probably like something like this, or maybe even a little bigger, that had fell over. And he had dug a hole underneath it. So he had a little cover on top. And his wife lived less than a half mile from here with uh, her slave owner, Giles Reese. He was here almost, um, almost two months long. Yeah, 70 days total. Mm -hmm. His really end result was not to kill everybody, just kill every white person he saw, but was to try to make them change their minds about slavery. When we go there, the wind is always blowing up there. The place was kind of ordained for him. That there's a spirit there somewhere in those woods. Excuse me. And I can feel it here. When I come to this church, I'll be doing work. And I come once a week. I'm kind of the overseer. And, and I think about it quite a bit. And he, I can, he was all over this property and always welcome and always will be. But they were heads of slaves who had been headed, beheaded and stuck on the signpost. That's how the name got to that road. My grandfather used to say to me, he said, I think that was what brought about the beginning of the Civil War. People began to come dissatisfied. It triggers the Civil Rights Movement, I would mm -hmm. say. Oh, it did. I, th I think he stood up, he was a freedom fighter. He was yeah, uh, th That's it, what we call him too. And the Bible, I feel, was his salvation. His Bible, um, it passed into her family. In 1912, the courthouse is cleaning up the courthouse and the Bible is given to the family. The officials knew the link to the person family and the Francis family and, and the Turner connection. There were possibly as many as 17 ancestral members that were victims. Walter Person had the Bible for many years and his son Morris, it was passed down to him. So Morris, his, his stepdaughter, Wendy Creekmore Porter, she's uh, contact the Smithsonian. The curators, they authenticated it. One significant picture, uh, there's a old picture, it's used in a lot of the history books of the Bible taken on a tree stump. They take the water stain on one of the pages and they match that up. And, uh, and it was Nat Turner's Bible. We had the provenance. And so next thing the Smithsonian said, we want to keep this Bible. And, and we were approached, I had people said, you know, the Bible could have sold for several millions of dollars and, and it would not be right to capitalize on slavery. It's, and other people have told me, they said, well, you know, that was, kind of our Bible. I said, no, what, maybe the family was guardians, but it was Nat Turner's Bible. Right. With that Bible being in the Smithsonian, it, it tells a story. The, That's the, a great healer. It, and it really thank is. You, Mark, yeah, for doing so that. I, yeah. <laughs> Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, uh, the time is always right to do what is right. Mm -hmm. And it's, we'll look at it. That's, where it belongs. Mm -hmm. Woman by the name of, um, of Wendy Porter gave us a call and said that her family uh, had for many years uh, possession of Nat Turner's Bible. She and her, uh, her mother uh, were there to greet me uh, who were part of the Person family, uh, which was a fourth generation of the Francis family. 
Uh, interestingly, she said she wanted to make sure uh, that the Bible was in a place where people could understand it, where it could be taught and interpreted in a way that would not only show its, its importance and significance, but show its, its connection uh, to American history. And so what she dreamed, what she wanted, and what we were able to do as a result of acquiring the Bible has, has taken place. So we are grateful to the Francis family for that. The condition of the Bible when we found it, you could tell it was an old object. The pages were dog-eared, but you could also tell that someone carried it around uh, consistently, constantly. It just, it was a small pocket Bible. It had this kind of tannish color that also added to the sense of its age. The pages were very, very frail, not brittle. It needed to be handled with care. I think the conversations that this exhibit has sparked has been not only giving voice to African Americans, but also remembering that these enslaved people did not just sit and wait for a better day and pray that a better day was coming. Nat Turner was a, if there is such a thing as a spiritual Christian warrior, that's who Nat Turner was. Everything he did was because of a deep, fervent belief he had in the whole idea of freedom and also in following and being obedient to what he thought was a divine command. So I think it gives us an opportunity to talk about rebellion. It gives us a chance to talk about the resilience of the black community. And it gives us a chance to talk about the deep, deep longing for freedom and the deep, deep hatred of slavery. Somewhere around 5.5 million people have come to the museum thus far, and you are on floor C3, which is the beginning of our history gallery that goes from pre-contact Africa to the beginning of Reconstruction. On one side, we have Harriet Tubman, who fought in her own unique way. And on this side, we had Nat Turner. So Nat Turner represents one kind of rebellion within the black community. Gabriel Prosser, Denmark Vesey, and others were uh, similar sort of warriors uh, for freedom. We have something like 37,000 of those objects that, that tell about and interpret the, the journey of African Americans in America and in the diaspora. It provides me with perspective that I didn't get in high school, perspective I didn't get in college, perspective I didn't get in terms of seeing African Americans as part of the master narrative of America. This museum has helped convince me, and I'm hoping has helped convince all those who come to the museum that African American history is quintessentially American history. Well, the position of the museum was not by accident. We wanted to be in the nation's backyard. We wanted to be on the National Mall. We, we wanted to send the message that African American history is American history. And what better place to do that than here? What better place to suggest that, that we are part of the master narrative of this nation than here? in the central locale of what it means politically, socially, economically, culturally. All of that is a part of Washington, D.C., and so we are just overjoyed that we are a part of that community as well and that we are an integral part, an important part of that community. The museum is the only one in the nation fully dedicated to chronicling African American history, culture, and life. For more information, visit nmaahc.si.edu. Each year, 100 men and women represent their constituents in the Virginia House of Delegates. But there's one member who made history in a big way when she won the November 2015 election on her first try. 
I had a chance to sit down with Delegate La Charisse Aired right in the heart of her district at Demolition Coffee in Petersburg. It's very exciting to hold the distinction of being the youngest woman uh, and actually it came as a surprise. I called the clerk's office one day and asked them, has there ever been anyone younger than 28 to uh, get elected to the House? And they said, you know, well, we really don't know and we'll have to go through the archives and look it up and they did. And ever since then we got through the election and I've been carrying that distinction, which is just very, very exciting. I feel like part of the legacy that I want to have because I've been given such an amazing opportunity is to bring along as many young people as possible, uh, not just to be involved and engaged, but for young girls in particular to believe if you're doing the work, you have the knowledge, skills, and abilities, then to don't hold yourself back and believe that you can get in this position or any position for that matter as well. I often refer back to my upbringing, so I was born in Buffalo, New York, which is an area very similar to what uh, I represent in the house, uh, Petersburg, an old industrial town that has sort of a vibrant downtown area, but on the outskirts you have great amounts of poverty uh, and school systems that are on the up but have struggled for quite some time. Uh, my mother herself had me when she was 16. Um, but Seeing her work really hard uh, despite our circumstances and seeing the people that I now represent in some instances work really hard to improve their quality of life, it brings me full circle to uh, I think what my life is and what it has represented uh, for not just those in my family but those around me. When you walk down these streets, what do you see there? What do you see as far as potential and where this area is going? You know, I see so much history. There is so much that this city represents. And when you think about where we are going right now, you see people who are very proud because they know where the city once was. They know how uh, so many people come to Petersburg to learn about the place that it had in the Commonwealth's history. And they want to bring that back and they're very passionate. And so I'm just proud to be in this position at this time to try and shepherd in some of that progress. I think authenticity is so important, you know. Um, when I first was elected to the House, I can recall sitting around a table talking with some of my colleagues and trying to advocate for school funding. And when I refer to homeless students or poor people and I say, I know what this is because I lived it, it's a perspective that was absent from the table. And so that means so much to me to be able to have real genuine life experience that I'm speaking from. And the folks that are in my community, they see that I'm a real person. It's not a title uh, with me. It's about trying to really improve the livelihood of others because I know what it's like to not have and be without. I think I would be dishonest if I said that I do not have higher office goals, but I'm not in that place just yet uh, until I can say, hey, I've really got something done here in the area that I represent. In addition to her role as a representative of the 63rd District, aired as a husband and two sons, ages 7 and 11. She also balances a full-time job as the Assistant Director of Development at Richard Bland College of William & Mary. Crown him with many crowns this week's Spotlight on Virginia Music shines on Nate Emanuel. Based in Charlottesville, Nate Emanuel is a hip-hop pop artist with a message that truly expresses his faith. Born the son of Jamaican immigrants and raised in a military family between Texas and Virginia, Nate's musical variety is a direct reflection of the diversity of his life experiences. In college, his musical horizons began to expand, and now he not only raps, but also displays his talent as a vocalist and a songwriter. In 2016, Nate released his debut EP, Foreigners, and in 2018, he released his second EP, Unraveling. Here now is a clip of Nate performing his original song, Hallelujah, Lord, come down. Thanks for watching Virginia Currents. Join us next time for more inspiring stories. I'm Amy Lacey. Hallelujah, Lord, come down, sing it. Hallelujah, Lord, come down. Fountain above our fire.
crown sing it hallelujah lord come down foundation solid ground sing it hallelujah lord come down lamb of god by sinners bound sing it hallelujah Yeah.